Anthony Rowland Knight. Why Anthony Rowland Knight may not be joined in marriage. May not be joined in marriage. To Sally Ann Cox. To Sally Ann Cox. No. I declare that I know. I declare that I know. Of no legal reason. Of no legal reason. Why I, Sally Ann Cox. Why I, Sally Ann Cox. May not be joined in marriage. May not be joined in marriage. To Anthony Rowland Knight. To Anthony Rowland Knight. of true minds admit impediments. Love is not love which alters an alteration finds. War bends with the remover to remove. Oh no, it's an ever fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. It is the star to every wandering bar. Its worth is unknown, although its height be taken. Love's not time's fool, though rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickle scope has come. Love alters not with his brief hours and weeks, but bears it out even to the edge of doom. If this be error, and upon me proved, I never writ, nor no man ever loved. and Sally, the vows you are about to make will join your lives and bind all your hopes and dreams for the future. And therefore I ask you now in the presence of your guests, do you, Anthony, pledge your love to Sally and promise to be loyal, loving and faithful to her for the rest of your lives together? I do. And do you, Sally, pledge your love to Anthony and promise to be loyal, loving and faithful to him for the rest of your lives together? I do. Now would you both please stand facing one another and hold hands together so that you say your marriage vows to each other and not to me. <laughs> and if you'd like to repeat the following words after me, starting with that word. I, Anthony Rowland Knight. I, Anthony Rowland Knight. Take you, Sally Ann Cox. Take you, Sally Ann Cox. To be my wedded wife. To be my wedded wife. I, Sally Ann Cox. I, Sally Ann Cox. Take you, Anthony Rowland Knight. Take you, Anthony Rowland Knight. To be my wedded husband. To be my wedded husband. Now, Sally and Anthony have written some words of their own, and they're now going to say those. Anthony, would you like to start, please? I pledge this day to trust and appreciate you. I promise to respect and cherish your uniqueness, and to support, comfort, and strengthen you through life's joys and sorrows. I promise to build a life together based on our mutual concern, compassion and honour. I will be faithful and loving in good times and in bad from this day forward. Thank you. Yes, I pledge this day to trust and appreciate you. I promise to respect and cherish your uniqueness and to support, comfort and strengthen you through life's joys and sorrows. I promise to build a life together based upon mutual concern, compassion and honour. I will be faithful and loving in good times and in bad from this day forward. Thank you very much. 
Now, would everybody else like to take their seats? But would you remain standing? The traditional way of sealing the marriage vows has always been the giving and receiving of a ring. The wedding ring is an unbroken circle with no beginning and no end, symbolising unending and everlasting love. And this is the outward sign of the lifelong promises which you have just made to one another. Now, I know we have two rings because I've checked very carefully with David, best man. <laughs> so David, if you'd step forward please. Please present Anthony with Stella's ring. Place it halfway into Sally's finger. That's it. And say the following words while looking at her, please. <laughs> Sally, I give you this ring. Sally, I give you this ring. As a sign of my love. As a sign of my love. And as a symbol of our marriage. And as a symbol of our marriage. Okay. Push it all the way down. It's perfect. That's not coming off, is it? <laughs> David, would you like to go around the other side and present Sally with Anson's ring? Would you place it onto his finger, please, and say the same words to, to him. Anthony, I give you this ring. Anthony, I give you this ring. As a sign of my love. As a sign of my love. And as a symbol of our marriage. And as a symbol of our marriage. Put it all the way on. That's perfect. That's not coming up there, but that's good. <laughs> Thank you very much. Would you like to sit down? Thank you very much indeed. And would you both take your seats? <coughs> so now we're going to hear from our second reading which is read by Nigel. So I'd like to invite Nigel to come forward, please. So this second reading of Sally and Anthony have chosen is known as the wedding blessing of the Apache. <laughs> <laughs> now you will feel no storms. You will be shelter, each to the other. Now you will feel no cold, for each of you will be warmth to the other. Now there is no loneliness, for each of you is companion to the other. You are two persons, but there is one life before you. And one hope. Turn together to look at the road you travelled to reach this, the hour of your happiness. It stretches behind you into the past. <coughs> look to the future that lies ahead, a long and winding adventure-filled road whose every turn means discovery, new hopes, new joys, new laughter, and a few shared tears. May happiness be your companion. May beauty surround you both in the journey ahead and through all the years to come. Go this day to your dwelling place and enter into your days together. May your days be good and long upon the earth. Your adventure has just begun. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you very much. So, Anthony and Sally, today is a new beginning, the start of a new life. The, ma the vows you have made to each other are a formal and public pledge of your love and a promise of lifelong dedication. Marriage requires devotion, patience, and understanding. And if you remember this and always support each other through the ups and downs of married life, the love you so obviously have for each other will deepen and grow stronger throughout the years to come. You have both made the declarations prescribed by law and have made a solemn and binding contract in the presence of your guests assembled here today. And now it is my great pleasure to announce that from today, Saturday, the 4th of June, 2016, you are lawfully joined in matrimony and the husband and wife together. And I'd like to be the very first to congratulate you. And Anthony, I'm sure your guests won't mind if you give your beautiful new bride a kiss to seal the occasion. <laughs> Thank you. 
Ladies and gentlemen, raise silence for your group. Ooh. Ooh. I think I think I'm. Yeah, I've just turned on. Yes, it's definitely turned on. Um, ladies and gentlemen, what a grand day this is. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's traditional for me um, to start my speech with um, trying out the phrase, my wife and I. Um, <laughs> um, Sally, Sally will be speaking a few words later on. Which, um, leaves me, <laughs> which leaves which leaves me um, to express myself exactly as I as, as I as I would wish to, and once I'm going to once again I'm going to say with very great feeling what a grand day this is. <laughs> um, the traditional format for groom speeches, I believe, is that um, uh, they take the format of a series of thank yous. And obviously, the first thank you, and perhaps the biggest thank you, is to all of you guys for coming here, from travelling from far and wide, to come and spend this, our special afternoon, um, with us. We very much appreciate <laughs> all the efforts you've made, and we are very much looking forward to spending the rest of the evening with you. <laughs> the second big thank you that I have to make is, of course, to Sally's family um, for welcoming, welcoming me into their, um, into their midst and making me feel um, really part of the family. Um, that includes uh, Jez, um, Sally's brother, and his family, Tamsin and Summer, um, and also uh, Tim and Pauline, um, the parents of the bride. <laughs> um, I, um, uh, special debt of gratitude to the parents of the bride who on occasional trips to Middlesbrough have improved my domestication considerably. Indeed, <laughs> they have introduced me to a whole new chapter in the book of table manners. I, I now appreciate that it is wise always to hold your claret against the source of the light not only to appreciate the rich red ruby colour imparted by the grapes of Burgundy, but to seek for small apertures filed into the etchings on the side of the glass, which under certain circumstances might deposit the, shirt, deposit the contents down the shirt fronts of the unwary. <laughs> <laughs> to peer gingerly over the lip of the marmalade jar in the morning, fearful that it might be populated by an army of small ants <laughs> that at first sight appear not to be made of plastic, <laughs> and to always assiduously stir your tea into, in the expectation that by such process we beasties with Made in Hong Kong stamped on their bellies might be brought to the surface <laughs> for inspection prior to you reaching your lips. Ladies and gentlemen, in good humour, I would like you to raise your glasses and drink a toast to Tim and Pauline. Tim and Pauline. I suspect the last laugh will not be mine. <laughs> um, it's also important for me to, important for me to um, 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 spare a thought to my own parents, Betty and Roland, um, for certain their love and sacrifices, and indeed there were sacrifices, um, have made me much of, much of what I am today. Um, neither of them can be with us, and this is um, uh, to my great regret. I will always regret that my parents aren't, aren't here on my wedding day. Um, I am fortunate, I think, that mother met Sally um, late last year, um, uh, and my mother understood that this, far, this day was not so far distant in the future. Um, um, and um, uh, for certain it was mother's abiding wish that I should find Sally. I also have to introduce me briefly to the gang who are assembled on the balcony. <laughs> 
<laughs> much, much, much thanks to those guys um, for their help and support um, over uh, uh, any, I'm not going to mention them, over any numbers of years. Um, <laughs> we've travelled a very long way together. I regret to report to regret to report that much of that journey has been made on bicycles, and most of it in search of the perfect alehouse. Uh, part of the gang sitting with us today is Dirge, who is my best man, um, uh, who, who I have to thank for his. Um, uh, thank for discharging his um, uh, offices with a plong both last weekend, although we remain quiet about that one, last weekend and this weekend. So thank you very much, David, for um, for for being your best man. Why are you remaining quiet again? Last weekend. <laughs> I feel the stag night should remain. <laughs> just, just, just on principle. Okay. Um, we do, we do regret, <laughs> we do regret that David's wife Sally has had to fly back to New Zealand. So um, uh, we, she had something we more that. important. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so thank you very much for that, and also to Sue Gardner, uh, who provided the accommodation last weekend. In oh, fact, yes. so if you could pass that one on, that would be um, um, that would be delightful. Um, so I just, I just wanted to, I just wanted to finish. I'm going to I'm going to recite. I hope these I hope this isn't misplaced. I'm going to recite a love poem to Sally. Um, there's been there's been there's been a lot of music um, this afternoon, and there's going to be more music yet. Um, none of it precisely reflecting um, my formative years in the early 1980s, and much of that teenage angst that was expressed in popular music um, you couldn't possibly recycle for a wedding venue. Um, <laughs> But I am going to recite a poem, and the words that I've chosen are, are by John Cooper Clark. <laughs> so, Sally. I want to be your raincoat for those frequent rainy days. I want to be your dreamboat when you want to sail away. Let me be your teddy bear. Take me with you anywhere. I don't care. I want to be yours. I want to be your electric meter. I will not run out. I want to... I want to be your electric heater, you'll get cold with that. I want to be your setting lotion, hold your hair in deep devotion, deep as the deep Atlantic Ocean, that's how deep is my devotion. Thank you very much. I think Sally would like to have a go with the microphone. <laughs> well, Tony's worked very hard on his speech, and I'm afraid I'm going to read mine <laughs> from a script. Oh, so I just wanted to add my thanks to Tony for you all travelling here to, to see us at some of not inconsiderable distances, um, some from halfway around the planet. Um, Ooh, and uh, yeah, yeah there's a dirge here from New Zealand. Um, but when I first met Tony many years ago, um, he was dressed all in black, which is not unusual in itself, um, but wearing a black papier mache exoskeleton, <laughs> <laughs> consisting of a long, knobbly spine and a bony tail that people kept tripping over, which he eventually had to remove. Uh, at that time, I had green hair and was wearing a pointy hat. <laughs> it was a Halloween party. <laughs> I don't normally dress like that. I don't think you've normally dressed like that before. <laughs> anyway. Um, yes, he, he has been known to wear some slightly odd things, but that's somebody else's job to tell you about that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, do the trousers. I've got other stuff. Trousers? <laughs> oh, OK. Do the other stuff. I haven't heard it. No, no, no. I haven't got any more. <laughs> it's all yours. It's all. Uh, anyway. After that first meeting, we then proceeded to ignore each other for about the next 14 years, save for a small number of coincidental attendances at the same social events, um, until eventually we both found ourselves single at the same time, and the rest, as they say, is history. So I thought I'd just briefly extemporise, because it seemed to fit fairly well on the theme of something old, something new, something borrowed, something blue. Uh, some English folklore saying from the late 19th century, as far as I can trace it back according to Wikipedia, so it must be true. <laughs> Old. 
And I was looking for my sewing box for something to hold up a hem with, I came across a packet of Wonderweb, which proudly announced itself as coming with compliments of Woman's Weekly. <laughs> well, I've certainly never bought a copy of the Woman's Weekly, but I know somebody who has. <laughs> so it must be well over 30 years old. <laughs> Moreover, it still worked. <laughs> But the mention of the Woman's Weekly put me in mind of the late, great Victoria Wood. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no further comment needed. <laughs> Something new, moving swiftly on. <laughs> well, I got a couple of new things for the wedding. Yeah, most people do. And even the Wonder Web was new once. Something borrowed. At this point, I have to pay tribute to Tony's mum, Betty, who died last year in August, age 91. Um, before she went into the home where she lived for her last 10 years, she'd been very skilled at sewing and knitting. And an example of this is shown uh, amongst the photos on the dresser in the next room, um, which includes a picture of a knitted doll which she made around at least 30 years ago, well before I came on the scene, um, which oddly enough she'd called Sally Scarecrow. <laughs> <laughs> How did she know? <laughs> As far as Tony's neighbours are concerned, I don't own any clothes other than tracksuit bottoms, daubed with paint and an old pink anorak. <laughs> so today was my chance to prove them wrong. <laughs> and I shall do all my gardening in this from now on. <laughs> Something blue. Well, I probably don't need to point out that there seems to be a bit of blue around in the theme today, in general, in various places, in the flowers and elsewhere. Um, and it's just a pity that um, the, the part that we had to cut out from the, uh, the piece by Percy Granger that uh, we left the ceremony room to, um, I had to have a cut uh, in order to keep it down to a suitable length. Um, but the line started, the section that was cut was started with the line, she donned a kirtle of blue so bold. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, I had to look up kirtle. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, well, just before I do, I'll ask Tony. You know what? He knew. <laughs> yeah. So it's um, well, it's it's a um, it's a woman's gown amongst other things. Um, and uh, well, Tony's very well read. Um, much better than me. Um, we know a lot of unusual stuff, not only related to his academic sub subject of biology, but also uh, things from classical lit literature and ancient and modern history. Um. So I hope to save a lot of time in the future, which I would otherwise spend reading, um, just by asking Tony. <laughs> so I'll do it. Aside from that, he's also a kind, caring and supportive companion, and I feel very privileged to find my, my soulmate in Tony. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Facebook showing a picture of himself, who sings alto, um, with a, a label saying alto fragile, <laughs> <laughs> which reminded me that the week before I'd seen in a shop some wine that was labelled Ford de Alto. <laughs> 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 there we go, thank you for that. Accidental and timely. So, some time ago, I got nominated as Best Man. This was done by email in the sort of modern way, you know. And uh, it immediately started this great flow of anecdotes. Um, literally, you know, oh, he's going to be Best Man. Oh, well, do you remember the time when? It was more or less the way it went. Um, we had some quite good ones, most of which I think that lot up the top will all remember. Um, we've done a lot of cycling and boozing and sort of country walking and, um, well, I've no more boozing, really, um, <laughs> together. And uh, we've seen Anthony in some strange situations, and he seems to have this thing about his trousers. <laughs> <laughs> there was the occasion where we were doing a cycling punk roll, which was something we used to do when we were still young and tough. Um, the idea is you do about 15 miles and perhaps six or eight pubs. And, um, you know, the cycling sort of saves you up between the pubs, and it all works quite well, really. And we arrived in one of the pubs, and he's standing there with this stupid grin on his face, and we all said, what's the matter with you? And he said, I cycled all the way from the last pub with no trousers on, and nobody noticed. <laughs> 
What a waste. And there was another occasion, I wasn't on this one, he was out on Dartmoor and apparently he just walked along behind everyone else with his trousers hanging around his ankles <laughs> to see how long it took before they noticed. Oh dear. Oh dear. Oh dear. <laughs> There was also a really excellent story that when he was at university, he took all his clothes off, dyed himself green, and ran through Hyatt Baker Hall, announcing that he was a jolly green giant. But that actually turned out to be a hoax that one of that lot had put around. But it's a good story. <laughs> so, anyway, um, I was told I'm going to be a better man. So, you know, there are certain duties to go with the best man. And... Um, Normally the speech is the bridesmaids, but Sally has sort of covered that already, really. So I got sort of thinking about this, and I, I thought, well, hmm, um, okay. I, the first thing I decided was clearly this means I don't have to restrict myself to Anthony here. Um, I can tell you that we are doing a sort of very lightweight musical number next door afterwards, which is going to involve almost anyone who can do anything, include bank a cardboard box. And Sally has sent me over 30 emails organising that. <laughs> <laughs> she is, however, the only woman I've ever met who has bee orchids growing in her next door neighbour's lawn. <laughs> well, I think that's stylish myself. So, in the end, after a certain amount of discussion between the three of us, this wasn't me, um, we decided that I am going to propose the toast to the bride and groom, which I reckon is the plum toast, so I'm pleased. <laughs> Now then, after this had all settled down, we then got involved, as you've heard, with doing some music next door, which kept us happily, me and Graham and Andy up there, happily occupied for a while. And I was quite happy to find that most of my duties seemed to have been taken off me. Debbie, who's been organising things very well, has replaced me. They said, one of the reasons we've chosen you as the best man is because you've got a loud voice. Well, you've seen that, but I was supposed to be shouting when you're actually moving around from room to room as well, not just when you're taking photographs. Um, and I got an email from Ellie, one of the gang, up the top there. She said, I've got something I want to give to them, and I want to do it, it sort of publicly, and um, um, how do I do it? And I thought, why is she asking me? Sally is the person who's organising all this. But I said, I'll tell you what, I can do it in the speech. And Ellie said, oh yeah, that'd be all right. So we have this. Now, I don't know what it, if it's rubbish, you can throw it away because I haven't seen it. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> Go on, open it. Do we, do we open it? Do we open it? We open it. It's not a real bow. This apparently is a collection of Oops. Anthony's early artworks. You know he's an artist. From... Ooh. Slightly Funny. eccentric artist. <laughs> not very commercially successful artist. It's strange taste. It's like a castle of skulls. <laughs> Actually, that's, a, yes. that's another good story. He went down to the Reading, a Reading junk shop and he oh dear, yes. found a leopard skin perched across the back of a chair in there. Ancient leopard skin. And it's a snow leopard. Now, I expect a lot of you know how rare those things are. So, the animal, before you be all judgmental about this, the animal is long dead. It must be someone's Victorian hunting trophy. So, it's fair game, you know, uh, as it were. And um, Anthony buys it and comes home rejoicing. And he puts it on the back of his chair and develops the most appalling sneezing fit he's ever had. It is true. So we now know that he's allergic to snow leopards. <laughs> <laughs> so he took it up to London and swapped it for an aurochs skull. <laughs> and he's got true. badger skulls and all sorts of other stuff like that in his house. And so he presumably has accepted all this. And, Taken this as reasonable. Yeah, no, okay. Good. That's all right then. Right. Um, Stagnite. Stagnite was um, jolly good. It was thoroughly um, respectable. I don't know why we're not allowed to speak about it. No, good. Um, I did suggest we might get some interesting women, and he told me no. I said it was possibly our last chance. And he still said no. Um, I think the thing about these two is they are grown ups, they're not callow youths. <laughs> They know what they're about. This is not try it out and see if we like it and in a few years' time we'll bugger off in a different direction than someone we met down at the pub and we fancy bit. <laughs> I see Sally here as the lioness striding the Serengeti, <laughs> shaking her mane in the wind. 
Olyan beszélni már egy nagy lesz, ez nem lehet. Well, for the purposes of this analogy, they do. And, you know, she comes to the water hole, and this mighty crocodile comes out and bites her head off and drags her down into this cave full of skulls, and they stay together forever. <laughs> <laughs> and on that principle, I propose, ladies and gentlemen, that we drink a toast to the bride and groom, the happy couple, Sally and Tony. <laughs> Thank you. Right, that's me. Thank you. We're done. Do you want to take over? One, two, three. Are we ready? Yeah. Yeah. Good Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the one and only performance of the After Spread Big Band, performing our one and only song. Introducing Mr. Andrew Pillage on guitar. Hey. I don't know who this fellow is, I haven't introduced him yet. And fresh from his tour of the clubs of Germany, Mr. Graham Manane on the family. On keyboard we have Fats Roll. Like furniture. 